Okay. So welcome. This is the first webinar of the demo project. The demo is a Horizon 2020 project from this year to 2018 to reassess the fiscal and monetary policy framework. We had many activities. You should check everything in our demo webpage. But today we want to have a discussion about the experience from the crisis and lessons we can get out of it. Of course, this is a major issue, and we will not solve it in one hour. But uh, we want to have a small discussion with uh, some of our PhDs and postdocs in the ADEMO working group here at the European University Institute, with members of the ADEMO advisory committee and of the demo team. In particular, let me welcome Thomas Cooley, who's far away from us in Santa Barbara, but uh, so thanks for coming out in the morning. He's a professor at New York University, Stern in the school where he was a dean, a very successful dean. But also he has been following the crisis, the financial crisis, and publishing on it and how to deal with it. We also have, he's the chair of the advisory committee. Giancarlo Corsetti is one of our members of the team and, and he's a professor at Cambridge University, and has been publishing extensively in macroeconomics international, in particular in issues on the debt crisis. He's been one of the authors of this CPR report, assessing a consensus report, but uh, he's actively working on the project, and therefore we want to see also his views. The views of everyone is not only about the policy, but also questions of research that we might be interested in developing further. Most of the questions will come out today, and she will come up in following up workshops and activities. We're also very pleased to have with us René Smith. He's one of the legal experts, member of the advisory committee, but also has been extremely active in the banking system in Europe. In particular, he's advising the ECB in, and has been one of his uh, in the executive Exactly. Oops. Anyway, so let's just get started with the questions of our postdocs. And Leanne? Yes. Uh, uh, first of all, hello to everyone. So the first question is why there is consensus? that excessive public and private debt have been triggering factors of the euro crisis, there has been less consensus on two issues. First, whether we should uh, focus on total debt, that means private plus uh, public, or uh, not just on public debt. And the second is whether sovereign debt restructuring should have been used more extensively, for example, in Greece uh, 2010. Looking ahead and given the existing sovereign debt limits, uh, Burton, sorry, what do you think about uh, these two issues? So we have a first question about the debt from Liana Loop, who is one of postdocs. Is anyone who wants to get started? Giancarlo? I, I can uh, go, definitely. So, uh, those are two separate issues, but are related by one particular uh, link, which is the fact that the, in the Euro area, relative to other regions in the world, we face a, a, a large uh, sovereign risk crisis, which is uh, has become effectively a country risk crisis. And this is vastly due to a problem with the architecture of the URA, an incomplete monetary union. The fact that we uh, had a very little mechanism, not only to share risk, but especially to contain endogenous risk coming from shocks. So uh, it is definitely clear that private and public debt per se, are the stock of liabilities in a 
macroeconomic sense, it's a liability to have a large stock of debt, whether it's private or public. When uh, the design of the institutions that should contain uh, spillovers should uh, uh, make sure that uh, uh, shocks are uh, propagates to the economy through normal, you know, real and financial uh, uh, channels that do not grow out of control once markets are uh, unsure about the integrity of the euro area, are not clear about uh, the possibility of uh, uh, correcting uh, imbalances in by a country uh, due to imperfect credibility not only of the government but also the institutions of the of the of the union. So to the first question, I think that a focus on public plus plus private debt is uh, correct. About the sovereign debt restructuring, uh, uh, it is the other side of it, which is uh, you cannot go to sovereign debt restructuring and monetary union without uh, a, a coordinated or some kind of political cohesion and consensus, or consensus how to do that. And this is the original scene of the monetary union, and perhaps the biggest lesson from the experience of the euro area for what it means to create a currency union. Uh, maybe not, it's not about labor mobility. Maybe it's not about price flexibility. There is no price flexibility in the US, in the counties where the crisis is uh, uh, most uh, severe. Not, not, not substantial price flexibility. Actually, to, according to many estimates, almost no price flexibility. So uh, um, the, the, the typical concern of the optimal currency area literature are, are uh, are the background of the problem, but the core of the problem, I think, is still the fact that uh, uh, it's a good example of how uh, building an incomplete monetary union creates uh, uh, the debt issue in the sense of uh, uh, letting, you know, my, my, my image, and I stop here, is that we let the default risk out of, of the bottle and we are still dealing with uh, the endogenous divergence that they created because of lack of instruments of uh, management and control, macroeconomic management and control. I should stop here, otherwise I can go on. Yes, let's, let's move on. <laughs> Tom? Well, I, I, I certainly agree with the idea that uh, what matters is both the, the total amount of indebtedness. Um, and it's hard to argue with uh, uh, the view that uh, the Euro project was uh, an incomplete design at best. It was way too dependent on rules um, of behavior uh, imposed on political entities that are very, very different um, and not, uh, not as clearly focused on the design of mechanisms that would sort of deal with uh, countries that, that experienced crises or got out of line and so on. And, but ultimately now what's happened is that, and, and I also think that uh, in the case of the first round of the Eurozone crisis, um, <clears throat> there was not enough acknowledgement of the need for restructuring of the debt that existed. Uh, and uh, because it was such uh, an incomplete job, it just made the crisis worse. Um, but the crisis has now become a political crisis. And that's the, that's the other sort of troubling uh, aspect of the design is that when, when economic fortunes diverge like this, uh, then what seem like uh, issues that can be addressed with economic policy, either centralized or, or by the sovereigns, um, the politics has taken over. And, uh, you know, that, that the Greek tragedy is really the political tragedy that occurred after the initial uh, crisis, um, in, in which the, the Greek public were led to believe they could get a, a better resolution uh, from their European partners. Um, uh, so, you know, it, it's an incomplete design, and the question is, how do you, how do you fix this 
when fortunes are diverging and politics are diverging? Uh, that's the big, that's the big question on the table, I would think. How, how do you see it, Renee? Um, but perhaps a few words first on the incomplete design. Um, I fully agree with Thomas that that has been the case, but in several aspects, uh, there's been far too much reliance on market discipline in the Maastricht Treaty. Uh, the absence of joint or single supervision has now been remedied, but that is a, a major birth defect that we have now remedied. Um, underdeveloped economic policy coordination and an issue that I don't see um, highlighted a lot, but that I think is also uh, has been conducive to um, exacerbating the crisis, the lack of clarity on ELA, uh, the Emergency Liquidity Assistance Lender of Last Resort uh, support by the central banks, where it was allocated. Um, and actually, to my mind, the ECB should have taken um, control of that issue far earlier. But having said that, there's one issue that I think the question raises that I'd like to say something about, but that very much relies on um, what Giancarlo just said, prior political agreement, which is sovereign debt restructuring. I do think we should have relied on that earlier on, and we should in the future have some kind of mechanism whereby uh, sub-federal entities, whether they be states or sub-entities of states, uh, can restructure their public debts in an orderly fashion. That's just an idea. It's, it's SDRM-like, what, what the IMF has proposed in the beginning of this century for countries across the globe. It has to be developed. I don't have a blueprint, but that's one of the areas I think uh, research should be focused on. Thanks. Do you have more questions? Uh, Johannes Fleck? Johannes. Yeah, so here's the next, yeah. uh, here's the next question. And it has to do with something that was already mentioned uh, in the previous answers, namely, what is the role of uh, economic convergence in the uh, European Monetary Union and the importance of it? So in the past, we used to think that it's an absolutely important prerequisite to a rule-based governance and also to having a single common monetary policy. However, what we've learned from the, uh, the sovereign debt crisis now is that not only is monetary union alone not a guarantee for convergence, but also the divergence uh, among the member states has actually now become uh, even stronger. So against this backdrop, I'd be interested to hear your view on, on this development. Do you think that the current socioeconomic divergence that we see uh, promotes economic fragilities in the uh, European Monetary Union? And do you think that the current framework can actually address these issues? So, do we need a different framework for a heterogeneous union, or is, is the, the current setting able to deal with divergence um, even in the long term? It's a question that's clearly related to what we had before, which is now not only we had the debt, but also divergence, as we had before, but we had it even more for some countries. How do we see, how do we design, is our design resilient to that? Tom, you were mentioning these issues before. Well, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I, this, clearly this is, this is the problem because when you have diverging economic fortunes, um, then this raises the political tensions that really I think are the, are the more troubling parts of what's going on in, among the periphery countries. Um, um, and that's that's an issue of uh, that I don't know how to how you design around that. I don't think it's a, particularly a flaw of the euro of the original uh, conception of what the eurozone could or should achieve. Um, but it was perhaps too uh, optimistic to think that economic convergence and structural reform was going to ensure sort of common paths of developments. And this has been exacerbated by uh, what was really an external shock um, in the form of the, the financial crisis of 2008. And so I think that just revealed how fragile uh, this, this design can be. Um, now, whether you, whether or not you can build in fiscal sufficient fiscal stabilizers to 
to deal with this. I'm, I'm not sure. I don't see it as, I don't see it as necessarily uh, very likely in the, in the current uh, uh, state of things, but I also don't think it's, um, I don't think it's very, very possible. So, um, or I, I don't think it's necessarily necessary. I think what is necessary is to figure out where you can uh, you can achieve greater. Sorry, I got. Apologies. Sorry. <laughs> Other devices going on. Um, yeah, and I th I think that you know a bigger issue is uh, to to fix the things that you can fix uh, and leave it to. Uh, to, to government policies to fix the, the issues of divergence and, and address the political issues. But then you see, in, we see in Greece and Spain, the other periphery countries, how difficult that can be uh, when there is a backlash against the kind of uh, uh, constraints imposed by the you know, common fiscal rules and so on. Yeah, but you don't see that Convergence is a precondition, do you? Convergence of, of GDP growth oh, rates? Oh, oh, uh, yeah, no, the, the, the structures. I mean, the US is also very heterogeneous in any case. So, yes. But we have, I mean, in the US, there has been over time convergence of uh, per capita incomes and growth rates. So. Rene, how do you see it? Well, perhaps um, a remark to start off um, with. Divergence has become stronger, was the introduction to the, to the question. But not only divergence, also discord. Discord about how to um, implement the fiscal rules um, and the fiscal rules themselves have been um, set up so as to lead to a kind of perennial discord between Brussels and not only the periphery, but every, every single member state that is subject to um, the commission telling them whether they're um, in compliance or not. So if we are going to be successful with monetary union, I think the um, rules-based framework should at least also be um, complemented with some kind of discretionary framework at the European Union or the Euro area level. Some kind of possibility for um, Euro area governance to uh, influence the Euro area economy from the center, whether that be through automatic stabilizers or otherwise. I'm not an economist, I'm just airing ideas here, but I think that is um, one of the things that I see as fragile for the future as well, if we continue to rely on a, a rule based, rules based system, which leads to this um, discord between Brussels and the national capitals um, and between the nations of North and South. So some kind of discretionary uh, option in the economic policy framework for the uh, euro area would seem to me to be a long term goal. Giancarlo, how you see it? Yeah, I mean, like the I think important points have already been made. And there is nothing wrong with, you know, especially short run and medium run divergence. It may happen. There are shocks. Actually, in the history of uh, you know discussion about economic uh, and monetary union, there has been a long discussion about endogenous currency area where. If anything, you know, Krugman made very clear at the point that uh, made very clear that actually monetary unification may well uh, uh, create a more uh, divergence there. But the what I, 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 the, the, but the point I think we are discussing here is the kind of divergence that uh, may be in part uh, a self-inflicted uh, policy pain. I mean, the, the, with the crisis, the level of uh, discord, of policy conflict, has been uh, growing kind of steadily. Uh, we saw uh, the, uh, 
divide, divide, dividing lines, the faulty lines, uh, the, in, the fault lines in uh, uh, Europe uh, opening up, uh, especially in 2010, 2011, after the Greek episode. Perhaps the peak of cooperation was 2012. If you remember in 2012, there was enough uh, initiative to reform, no, between 2011 and 2012, to reform cosmetically the Stabil and Group Act to agree on some kind of, of uh, uh, European stability mechanism at the time with a different name, uh, to accept Draghi taking some initiative with the uh, OMT's program. Uh, but since then, I think uh, I agree with, uh, I guess, the, the other two speakers agree with me. We are in a situation of ongoing policy conflict, of uh, initiatives at European level completely left to bilateral negotiation of, of uh, governments. So in a way that there is no more much Europe there taking initiative. And uh, this is uh, uh, not only a consequence of economic divergence, but it's also a cause of economic divergence in the sense that the, the, uh, the, the discord uh, means the important uh, uh, initiative for stabilization either not uh, considered at all or implemented too little too late. So uh, in a way we are seeing a, a, a sort of um, paradox in which uh, the benefit for corporations would be very, very large. But at this stage, uh, the incentive for single government to pursue their own uh, specific uh, you know, uh, agenda uh, in, uh, in opposition to others seem equally strong. So we, we know from game theory this is not a good, a good particularly good uh, uh, configuration no? to get anything sustainable in, in the form of cooperative. So um, I think the, it would be helpful to understand the part of the divergence is actually created by the by the conflict, there is this two-way feedback effect between uh, economic divergence and, and lack of cohesion on the on the solution, which is you know difficult to achieve because there is a, a larger legacy debt or legacy problem, lots of distributional issue to address. There is not uh, obvious how you you go ahead from there. On the other hand, I mean you were saying that things were better in some sense in two thousand and twelve. No, I'm saying that we, we, we saw in 2012, we saw a, a moment in which there was some initiative in terms of like a, perhaps the, the situation in 2011, if you remember, is like the, the moment yeah. of very the widening of the differential to level that uh, foreshadow a breakup. No? Uh, so the, at that point, I think under the heat of the crisis, there was a moment in which it seemed that some initiative could be taken. It was the, the moment of the roadmap, the decision about the banking union, the decision about uh, the stopping the sovereign, the most uh, pathological aspect of the sovereign risk crisis with the OMTs. Uh, since then, we are sort of going on on that roadmap, uh, but without a decisive uh, uh, agreement no, on uh, how to implement. There are still quite a bit of conflict going on. In my view. But on the other hand, we had the, a lot of intervention from the ECB, and, and we have the reports of the presidents. I, I'm how do you see, the, how do you see this element, René? Uh, let me go back to René on this. Yeah. Um, I, I'm not quite sure I, 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 I get what you want me to talk about, about the actions of the ECB, whether they are legal, well, because that was... <laughs> no, I'm not saying whether they are legal. But the, the fact that uh, there has been some common uh, action just taken by the ECB. Uh, and that has changed the scenario until we see it until last week, for example, on the way that yeah. policies are done at the national level. So. What I see is that um, almost the entire onus is on the ECB as the, the sole um, actor at the at the federal level, at the union level, that can act um, uh, ultimately, but only in its own sphere of competence, and that has been widened, of course, for several um, under several perspectives with banking supervision. But that's not the the, the main issue here. Uh, it has also been 
widened in the area of monetary policy being seen now far more um, as an instrument of reviving growth than it has been in the past, I think, with QE um, that has been um, put into um, effect uh, from Frankfurt as well. Um, whether we can ultimately, for a prolonged period of time, continue to rely on the ECB as the problem solver in the Union, I doubt. I think um, the ECB can buy time, can also make for uh, monetary conditions that finally uh, will, will lead throughout the Union, not just in Ireland, to some kind of growth um, that is more than just uh, you know, minimal. Um, but I, th I think on the other areas, economic policy coordination, some kind of uh, um, automatic stabilizers, there is a lot of work to be done um, by the other actors, as Mario Draghi doesn't tire to keep saying at the end of his press conferences, you know, time and again. It's, it's now up to the politicians. Yeah, I, I just yeah, have no. a question uh, about that issue. Uh, so one of the arguments that, that I've heard a lot, and I don't know how to, how to assess it, but that uh, it, it's true that the ECB is the only sort of strong institution that with the power to act within the monetary union as it, as it exists now, at least it, so it seems. Um, but then the question is whether um, their actions have actually uh, delayed the consideration of other of other policy solutions to the, these fiscal issues. So there's a lot of people think that there's a lot of people, uh, a lot of sentiment in favor of some kind of limited euro bond. And, and people have argued, I've heard the argument anyway, that um, that OMT, that Mario Draghi's intervention with OMT kind of took the wind out of the sails of people who who were looking for other fiscal solutions um, to these issues. Can I say something about that? Yeah. Sure. Yes, I, I specifically want yeah, to. Yeah, it to you. <laughs> I beg to differ. I think that Eurobonds, although that is something that I see certainly as um, a measure that um, we should ultimately adopt, but fell flat when there was this report by experts, um, I think two years ago, uh, that extensively explored the economic and legal and policy issues and, and decided that it was, the time was not right, something like that. I'm, I'm now almost uh, talking about it in a derogatory fashion, sorry for that. Um, <laughs> I do think it's become a central piece of the, of the future economic governance of, the, of your area. Um, whether the ECB has delayed that, I'm not quite sure. What you hear a lot is that it is delaying tough policy choices by um, what used to be called at the heart of the crisis, peripheral member states, because it's, their governments don't feel the pinch of the markets anymore. I'm, I, I don't agree with that, with that line of argument, because I do think that those structural reforms, first of all, have been undertaken, are being undertaken, take a long time to actually work through. Um, and all of that is not um, diminished by the fact that the ECB does what it thinks it needs to do to, um, to do two things, to, to ensure that its transmission mechanism is finally restored, monetary policy transmission mechanism, and that it is uh, reigniting the economy as far as it can as a, as a monetary um, authority. Um, coming back to the issue that you just raised, Thomas, Thomas I do think that eurobonds are still very much part of an ultimate, um, an ultimate solution to the lack of instruments that the monetary union has been endowed with from the beginning, one of its birth defects, so to say, um, because it would be some kind of um, mechanism to defeat the markets in unison as public authorities. That's at least how I've always, as a lawyer, looked um, at it. But it may very well need um, treaty change or uh, working on the basis of a parallel treaty like the fiscal compact and, and the other um, parallel mechanisms, ESM, that we have seen established. OK. We might come back to this, but uh, let me go back to the questions of the, our researchers. Joao, you want to ask any question? 
Don't forget it. Okay. Uh, so we already mentioned it a couple of times, and I'd like to ask you uh, if you think that the banking union will provide a necessary uh, resilience to the bank dependent European economy, and in particular, if uh, a European deposit insurance scheme uh, is a good policy to prevent future financial crises in a, in, in a segmented capital markets as we have here in Europe. So it that take us a little far afield on a banking union, but maybe it's a timing question given the interventions that now DCB open at the window to all the banks at the very cheap credit to not to say negative interest rates. Mm. Anyone wants to take a chance? Well, I, let me let me address the let me address what I think is at the heart of uh, of that question is, um, at, and that is the issue of banking union in Europe. So, from my perspective. Um, I think that that should have been, that's one of the few things that should have been an initial condition uh, for the implementation of the Eurozone. Uh, far more important maybe than, um, than fiscal union of any kind, but uh, banking union, I mean, the unified banking sector uh, would seem to have been one of the things that should have been put in place at the beginning. Uh, and that really, that they didn't, is really part of the original sin that uh, John Carlo talked about. Um, and then you have to ask, uh, even now, um, how people seem to be fairly optimistic about uh, Europe moving towards a unified banking system. Uh, the SSM, the single supervisory mechanism, the thing, single resolution mechanism, and then uh, uh, a unified deposit insurance uh, system is the is the next piece. Um, but I see progress towards banking union has as having been very kind of halting and sporadic, um, and uh, certainly the, there doesn't seem to be much if any commitment to the implementation of the third piece of this, which is the deposit insurance system. Um, and, and this is really this is really a critical issue because when you look at the role of banks in financing the economy, they're roughly twice as important in terms of um, lending as a percentage of GDP. It's twice as what it is in, in the US bank lending to non-financial uh, corporations. So uh, banks play a critical role. And uh, when you look at um, when you look at the capitalization of banks uh, uh, using, you look at the leverage ratios of European banks, they're still tremendously undercapitalized uh, by, by very raw measures. So when you look at the data, it's not surprising that European bank stocks have been hammered in the last several months because markets have lost a lot of confidence in the European banking system. And I would say in, uh, <coughs> um, in the commitment to, to banking union, as soon as someone introduces a new proposal for deposit insurance, immediately there are objections that say, well, we have to resolve these other issues before we can, th this is ultimately uh, a fiscal uh, issue and we have to resolve all these other issues about the uh, bank, <coughs> the uh, uh, the incredible uh, relationship between sovereigns and banks and the fact that in the weak countries, banks hold uh, uh, lots of sovereign, lots of debts of their home sovereign, the home bias and, and banks uh, asset holdings. Um, and the, the European solution that's been embraced uh, for this is uh, the use of different kinds of uh, uh, debt to, uh, that has the ability to recapitalize banks. Uh, so the, the growth of the cocoa bond market has been impressive. 
but we're just markets are just now realizing that cocoa bonds are like an ordinary bond with a hand grenade attached. So um, <laughs> you saw what uh, what happened to them when Deutsche Bank uh, was looking kind of shaky. It's happened a little shaky, and uh, so I think. I think the, uh, this is a critical issue that has to be addressed. It may be the, mo the more important, uh, one of the most important uh, issues in terms of promoting stability within the eurozone is to actually achieve this, um, this banking union in a way that's credible. How do you see it? I don't know, does that address your questions? <laughs> <laughs> Let, let me briefly say that, first of all, it's early days with banking union yeah. and especially with the single resolution mechanism. I mean, it's two months, two and a half months that it has been uh, up and running. Um, secondly, we've seen an enormous fragmentation of the financial markets, uh, perhaps not even of the financial markets, of all the markets in Europe during the crisis. Everyone going back to their own um, um, immediate surroundings almost, um, except for the very large players. Um, and that fragmentation is partially addressed, I think, by the ECB's novel or innovative monetary policy instruments, trying to restore the transmission mechanism of the monetary policy. On the other side of, of financial stability of the banking union, I do think we need this joint or single deposit insurance system, whether it will be actually able to, as one of the questions read, a good policy to prevent future financial crises, plural, in the EU. That's giving it too much of a of a of a, of a central position, but it is certainly key to to um, to the banking union. And what I hope the banking union will do by aligning supervisory approaches is also to finally, in the end, make for some kind of European banking system instead of a German and a French and an Italian and so on. Uh, but that will take time. That will take time. You see the ECB being very much, um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for a word here, um, which is not aggressive because that is too aggressive a word, but very uh, much um, active, which may be too passive a word. But anyway, in between those two approaches in making sure that there is adequate capitalization with uh, what is called threat processes, you know, additional capital that needs to be um, found by individual institutions based on their specific risk uh, profile. Uh, but that is also, it's the second tier only that they're doing this. So that will take time. That will take time. But even if it will take time, before I, Giancarlo, you want to say something? No, I completely uh, agree. Actually, there is one uh, aspect uh, I think also to add, which is uh, in addition of the novelty of the framework and the uh, fragmentation of the financial uh, markets, uh, not only the financial markets in Europe, there is also the unexpected persistence of the crisis. I mean, many countries have been for years losing GDP at the, at the tune of 10%. Of a 10 percentage point. So, this is the case of Italy, for example. Clearly, the banking system is now suffering from uh, you know, the fatigue of. Uh, so, um, um, I completely agree with everything that's been said. I would just add the fact that the banking union is basically in the hands of uh, a very subtle political management here. In the past, we suspended many rules about you know, state aid and everything, create a window of opportunities. Many countries have uh, acted early. Uh, other countries are acting late on this. And uh, as of January, we are, we are sort of bringing things together in an extremely fragmented framework where banks and sovereigns are linked together more than just the fact that banks are full of sovereign debt. The, the, the connection is actually much, much uh, stricter and has to do with the fragility of the economic uh, outlook uh, that is reflected on the banks. And having the bail-ins directive already now there, with the deposit insurance still subject of an ongoing discussion, is a bit of a... Uh, 
uh, you know, a dangerous path to take because uh, uh, rightly so, many, there is the risk that, uh, uh, you know, markets start to, to have uh, or develop strange uh, expectations, concerns about solidity of banking system in particular countries, which I think would be uh, uh, extremely destabilizing. So uh, rightly so, the ECB is uh, doing more than active, uh, less than aggressive, but definitely is there working. Uh, I guess that the ECB, they are completely aware of this point. Uh, but I mean, we, we may run, we run a concrete risk of a repeat of 19, 2011, where, you know, you, you get these um, uh, forces of, uh, um, divergence, let's call it like that. Also, is, is a little bit of a maybe more than divergence coming in uh, in terms of political mismanagement of this process. So, and uh, of course, you know, th there is also a, a, a legacy debt, a legacy debt also in the banking system now to be taken care of, which uh, is not irrelevant. So it will take uh, again some kind of. Um, if I if if I may just like uh, uh, at the move, we are actually uh, working on many uh, of these aspects, and one of the most qualified line of research is the idea of sustainability linked to uh, um, liquidity uh, agencies. You know the, the liquidity the, the framework of bailout, the regime of bailout and liquidity. Is going to be very important for, for, for Europe, especially because it may, you know, a good framework may create the right incentive and at the same time avoid, uh, 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 you know, let's let's call it uh, market uh, divergent forces that could, could, could just react to any uh, clear sign of lack of political cohesion, lack of uh, operation that has been in the past a problem. I would call, like so to go we, back to this issue. I, yes, yes, Tom. Okay. No, 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 you that's were saying. Fine, yeah. you uh, just more specifically, I wanted to, to raise a, a question related to that and the role of the ECB. Because an issue, for example, and this, I absolutely agree with Renee that banking union takes time. And there is this issue, of course, of the deposit insurance. However, I mean, the issue is basically whether the deposit insurance at the national levels are not enough and you need it at the Eurozone level. But as a matter of fact, I mean, now with the opening of the window by the ECB to the private banks, they are helping on that. I mean, now the scenario that the particular bank, it's only faces a run the same traditional way, I think that changes the scenario. Of course, the question is whether how far the ECB can go in providing the right liquidity in the right time. But as far as from the banking perspective, this scenario is different than being in a completely fragmented system. Don't you see it this way? What do you think, yeah. Tom? Or Rene? Yeah. I think th those are new developments that we didn't have before. So I'm saying is that the, the banking union is moving slowly, but I think that uh, the ECB is putting a lot of oil in accelerating the process or helping in a different ways. Yeah. How, how do you see it, Rene? Um, this is difficult because I see it actually as two different aspects of the ECB's role the banking supervision aspect on the one hand and the monetary policy issue, although they are related in the sense that uh, it's now the authority on, on, on both sides. Um, I don't know wh whether I can say a lot more about what, what a banking union will bring us than what I said before, uh, implying that uh, it, it'll take time and um, we'll need that time on the banking supervision side in the sense that um, we, we hope to rebuild the European banking industry in a manner that is conducive to a fully integrated industry um, taking place or, or being established, um, rather than the fragmented one with which we began and which started to dismantle and to become more and more of a, of a, of a single banking 
market, not in the retail area, but, but beyond, certainly, but which has now indeed been completely balkanized. Um, the, the other issue that has been um, highlighted both in the questions and also by, by Thomas and Giancarlo is the issue of, of deposit insurance, which um, I, I do think is the, uh, the missing link still in the, in the banking union, for which you also see Mario Draghi argue time and again that it needs to be established, uh, even though um, his host state isn't very keen on it. <laughs> So let's go back to the table. Anna, do you have any questions? Yeah. Anna, continue. Uh, I would like to go back to a topic such a with the Eurobond, which is fiscal integration. Um, in particular, how much of a fiscal union do we need in Europe? Because on the one hand, uh, the Financial Times uh, journalist Martin Sandro, in his book uh, Europe's Orphan, states that um, the euro area could do without a fiscal union uh, to guarantee stability. So fiscal union would not be a necessary condition uh, for stability. But on the other hand, the US, which is uh, the other big currency union which can be compared to the eurozone, is a fully fledged fiscal union. Um, and in particular, they have a, a very coordinated fiscal, union, fiscal policy with monetary policy. And this can be seen, for example, in their credit easing policies when the Treasury backed uh, the Federal Reserve uh, in doing them, and they were successful. So my question is, uh, how much of a fiscal union do we need, and if any, of course, and in case we do uh, need to move towards a higher level of fiscal integration, uh, how, would you, how would, would you do this? Well, that's certainly a, large, a big question that is certainly part of the research agenda of ADEMO, but uh, it's good to raise it and uh, we start seeing some views on that. Giancarlo, you want to say anything on that? I, I, I go back to what René was saying at the beginning on the Eurobond, the fact that there is the issue of what uh, we require a treaty change, what will not require a treaty change, what would be the appetite for uh, this thing. I thought that for the uh, longest time, uh, you know, the question was, uh, what, what are basically steps uh, that can be taken already uh, now towards guaranteeing uh, the functions that we think are necessary building blocks of a you no know, necessary for a currency union to be viable and uh, why not like contribute to prosperity like possibly uh, wealth financing in Europe. So the the um, this is a long standing discussion. I remember endless discussion with um, Ising and Pavel Stiop on this on different kind of. Uh, the minimum economic constitutions of, of Europe. And uh, you can actually make a list of things like you know, banking union, uh, uh, single supervision, you know, the, the, what we are doing right now. Uh, we could add the OMPs. Uh, we could add uh, a, a little bit more leeway for the ECB to do what it's doing right now, like uh, being able to use instruments uh, the right way. Uh, 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 for the for the union, I would actually go. I, I would concentrate on what we can do right now, even in terms of uh, creating something that, if it's not a euro bond, may guarantee the existence of some uh, uh, safe asset, common safe asset in Europe uh, in, in, in nominal terms. There are many proposals on the table which may not require a treaty change, and but I know that this is like legally always very controversial, so I'm happy to enter a discussion. So. I would say that the, uh, it would be very fruitful for us to understand what, what can be done right now that sort of accept functions that would be natural in a fiscal union, but that could be granted without going for a full fl fully fledged fiscal union. On the other hand, you know, besides fiscal union, EU has severe challenges in terms of uh, border policies, uh, um, uh, defense, uh, uh, energy, 
so those are like natural areas where uh, policy cohesion may come and bring in some aspect of a fiscal union. Uh, you know, basically uh, the, some aspect of environment. Uh, so all these may create uh, uh, a, a, the framework for advances. Of course, you know, I, it's ironic to, to, to raise this issue because today actually failing those things in exacerbate the policy conflict, clearly on migrants and border control. There is a huge policy conflict uh, that uh, if anything exacerbate what already the Euro is, uh, is bringing about. But I would, I, would, I would have a very uh, uh, functional approach, like if you want, a very practical approach to this issue, to see whether there are, there are areas in which we can find a, a, an agreement and just do it. How do you see this pragmatic approach, René? Uh, very much in agreement with a practical step-by-step -step approach, especially because of all the legal issues that there are with, with Eurobonds. Uh, but two perhaps um, kind of uh, perspectives in mind. Um, the, the one would be the, um, the final issuing of some kind of joint uh, public debt, which is also good for the integration of the financial markets and especially for the banking market, uh, but perhaps even beyond that with a, uh, a good uh, investment uh, vehicle, so to say, for the, for the markets. Um, so that's on the area of, of Eurobonds. The other is the um, the um, what's the word for that? Uh, the automatic stabilizers, uh, which at least some kind of research needs to be done into uh, whether we can whether we can establish some kind of um, mechanism that is not a guarantee mechanism from north to south, because that's what the the, the, um, the German finance minister will immediately call it, uh, but something that is working. Uh, evenly among the regions in, in, in Europe um, so that we have some kind of stabilization, stabilization mechanism in the real economy apart from just from the monetary authority. That would be my two thoughts at this juncture. May, may I just come in? I, I to totally agree with you, Rene. Automatic stabilizers, I mean, just to make it very clear, we had uh, the wrong fiscal stance at aggregate level for the longest time in Europe, and that costed Europe quite a bit. So I think when René talked about this, automatic stabilizer is also this idea that we need, a, as a continent, to act uh, reasonably on this. Uh, we cannot really go with a macroeconomic stance that, uh, in, at times, it become really, really wrong, really, really in the wrong direction. I don't know whether you agree with that or you think you more of a regional stabilizer, but there is also, there is also a, a an aspect that is uh, for the union as a whole, not for the stabilization. I guess we have. You mean that in many countries, you mean that many countries fiscal have been pro cyclical and but when you sum, when you sum the fiscal stance over countries, you know, you hardly have any reasonable uh, uh, euro level uh, uh, support of aggregate yeah. demand. Tom, how do you see this issue? Yeah, I mean, I well, I I, I uh, think that the the issue of uh, ultimately having something that is a common safe asset or a euro bond is would be an important part of the fiscal um, fiscal solution for that's missing now in terms of stabilization. But I don't think I I kind of agree with the view that you don't need to go to full fiscal union. Um, and I actually think the role of this safe asset would be a valuable one, um, but, it, but it should be limited in Europe because it's, it's, a, it's different, right? It's a different, uh, it's a different framework. And I think you can achieve, you know, I think you can achieve a lot of the stabilization that you need if you have more tools. And that would be one of them. Um, but I, I agree with uh, Giancarlo and uh, Renee that um, uh, the approach to this should be thoughtful and gradual, and you don't want to uh, assign too big a role to something like that. Um, because it, it, at the end of the day, there's so much uh, uh, fiscal authority invested in the sovereigns in Europe, and really the responsibility still lies there. Um, 
that that hasn't that hasn't changed uh, and that's doesn't seem to me politically likely to change um, and I also agree that uh, that the, the idea that you've had the wrong fiscal stance has, has uh, really created a lot of political unrest that's now become a bigger problem than uh, <laughs> than the issues uh, what what should be done at the European level I mean certainly in many countries the fiscal side has been seen like the stick not as the carrot so I think that uh, that's an element that is missing and Jan Giancarlo is pointing out to, we might agree in some policies, particularly now with the migration issue, that it's very difficult politically, but anything that is done, people will certainly see it at the European Union, or at least at the Eurozone. But the question is, we, we have an instrument. That's certainly an instrument, a common instrument might not require treaty change or anything, but it will require to decide who is the institution who takes care of that instrument. And so now we are putting maybe too many on the hands of the ECB and that's it. I mean, going back to Anna's question, in many cases, so the, some of the great easing policies of the Fed, the Treasury was a backing up. The same happens in the UK. Do we need something like that? There's not a full blown up fiscal union, but at least something that we can call the treasury. Now it's maybe the euro group, but that's not very well defined. It's not even an institution as such. And the ESM is not designed for that either. So how do you guys see this? You're asking a very easy question now. Okay, so we'll have a conference on that then. <laughs> <laughs> Based, based both on the gradual approach and on the fact that we have certain elements already. We have a Eurogroup, we have an ESM Board of Governors, um, we have ideas as to how finally a kind of fiscal backstop, just ideas, might be there for um, the, um, the, uh, the, the, the single resolution fund uh, under, under, banking, uh, under banking union. Um, based on all that, I think one of the issues we really need to have more research on is what a European Treasury could, um, could enact, so to say, what it should uh, uh, perform in terms of, of different functions. Uh, since, I'm, since I have the floor, uh, can I just say something to what you just said, Thomas, on the sovereigns and on political will, because you just uh, mentioned the two kinds of words that always get me nervous. So just one sentence. <laughs> First of all, um, the sovereigns, I think um, we can have a lengthy discussion about sovereignty, but to me it's quite clear that sovereignty is shared within the European Union, even though the people even in the yes camp in, in the UK will not, will not admit that. Uh, and so there is sovereignty at, at various levels, and it's not just the 28 or the, or the 19. Uh, and, and what I would invite the researchers to do is to look beyond political will, not only because it's flimsy, it's, it's temporal, it's something that is changing from one day to the other, uh, but also because we need valid, rational uh, arguments for certain measures or, or against certain measures or instruments, and not rely too much on um, the confines of what the um, current political debate uh, tells us is, is possible. So use your imagination, I would like to say. Okay, do we have any final comments? Uh, we're getting towards the end. We have a couple of questions also here, but uh, Stefanos Stanispoulos says, uh, since the financial crisis has infected the political scenery in the EU, where the notion of diversity has strongly propped up, what practical economic financial tools should we use to undertake the crisis, that restructuring? I think we have been dealing with this quite a lot, and we will deal more on these issues. And Charles Brandon is asking whether should the aggregate fiscal stance of the Eurozone become a centralized policy instrument determined annually, like the kinds of things we do nowadays? 
that's a more specific question about how do you implement some of the things we were discussing. I don't know if you guys want to add anything else, but we should just start wrapping up because we don't want to take too much time to our audience. And you want to have some final comments. And Carlo? Apart from visual imagination, no, just a small comment. Of course, you know, a political, a, 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 a macroeconomic stance is pretty much linked to something like the euro bond or addressing issue of defaultability, safe assets. It will clearly be hand in hand. You know, having, having a, 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 a fiscal stance in Europe with that uh, subject to this kind of uh, different pricing has always been an issue. And it will, will keep being an issue. So we may not go to, fis to full fiscal union, but uh, those two steps, the, 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 what, what René was saying, something not, not relying on, on current political will, but the functions and aspects of the, of the union that we really would like to have, uh, to recognize, you know? to, have, to have them recognized as fundamental elements of the thing. You know? It would be a good use of our imagination, we believe. <laughs> Tom? Um, you know, I would just like, I guess, like to come back to this issue that the, there is this, this fundamental tension in the design of the Euro, of the Eurozone and the Eurozone institutions that, um, <clears throat> that rests a lot of responsibility still with sovereigns and uh, so, if you don't view the Eurozone crisis as fundamentally a sovereign debt crisis, then I, I, I don't understand, it, rather, as a balance of payments crisis. Um, I, I see the balance of payments as the, the symptom uh, and the sort of fiscal policies of the sovereigns as the disease. Uh, and that, and that's why the, that's why these political tensions uh, boil over, and and I, I in, in my view, get in the way, you know, penalize their their own citizens uh, if they are engaged in this battle with the the, uh, the eurozone project. So, um, yeah, I I understand this is a process and it's evolving. Uh, I completely agree with Renee that this uh, that banking union takes time, fiscal uh, union, fiscal uh, uh, progress takes time. Um, but uh, it's very troubling to me that uh, that there is so much built-in tension in the design of the of the project. Renee. Well, let, me, let, me, let me say that I agree with you on that, Thomas, that there is too much built-in tension. And come back to what I said before, I think in reply to the first question about the divergence, uh, emphasizing the um, divergence as also a cause for discord, um, uh, meaning that, to my mind, the rules-based rules system will need to be balanced somewhat with some kind of discretionary functions at the euro area level, which means that in answer to the question of Mr. Brendan, I would say yes, ultimately we should have some kind of aggregate fiscal stance determined at the euro area level, uh, something in which the euro area treasury, whatever its uh, precise functions, will have a role to play in. But all of that is um, part of the vision at the end of a perspective for which incremental earlier steps may have to be taken. Okay, I don't want to take much more of your time, but then really appreciate all the comments and discussions. Uh, as I said, that part of our research agenda. We, if you look at our webpage, you will see the incoming events. We're going to have in Prague a conference on macroeconomic imbalances at the end of April, and one here at the European Institute on Resharing Mechanics, which is another element we have not talked today, but it's a complement to all these discussions we have now. So I think some of the questions have been raised and exactly things that we want to take on board. And uh, there was a question here, someone, whether we will, a demo will consider the different reports that have been developed and the, they will give suggestions about the EU in the autumn. 
That's exactly our purpose, to participate in this discussion. But it's our approach is to be sure that we do what we can call more basic research with this policy orientation. I think there were many questions about how fiscal and monetary policy interact and are designed about institutions that we have to be creative and how to develop those things. And very important, and that's I think it's very good that people like René Smith or our lawyers in the team play a role, that we make proposals that can be implemented in the legal situation of the Eurozone. So thanks everyone for participating. Thanks for our researchers and postdocs for bringing interesting questions on the table. And we'll continue with others. So be in touch with our webpage that will tell you all the news and incoming events. Thanks to everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And good luck. Thank you. Bye bye, Anand.